Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's lovely to see everyone that's joined us this evening. Uh, just by way of opening the meeting this evening, we'll sing hymn number 16. Hymn number 16. This is actually one of my favourite hymns, and I think um, it's been particularly brought before me over the past weeks and months as we've been studying in Romans. Um, the truth that we've been enjoying um, is, is summed up beautifully by the hymn writer in this hymn. Blessed be God our God, who gave for us his well-beloved Son, the gift of gifts, all other gifts in one. Blessed be God our God. Who shall condemn us now, since Christ has died and risen and gone above, for us to plead at the right hand of love, who shall condemn us now? Um, perhaps, just for sake of time, we'll just sing um, the first four verses of this hymn, uh, just keeping our seats. Blessed be God our Father, we just come before thee another evening, and Father, we give thanks um, for all of thy goodness to us, Father. We give thanks for the words of this hymn, and we give thanks for the truth that is in them. We give thanks that there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And Father, we give thanks uh, that those of us who are saved can, can count ourselves as being in Christ Jesus. Father, we give thanks for the blessing that it is to be in him. Father, we give thanks for him and for all that he has done for us. We give thanks uh, that it is the fact that we are in him that brings us here this evening. We give thanks for uh, the common bond that each one of us has and for the desire that we have to, to hear that word taught and to learn from it. And Father, we just pray that this time would be a blessing to us, mm -hmm. that as thy word is opened up, that we might indeed learn from it, that we might um, learn something of thy truth and that we might come away blessed and, and built up as a result of being here this evening, Father. Um, we look to thee for help for our brother David. We pray that he would know uh, thy presence and the enablement of thy Holy Spirit as he would open up thy scriptures to us. We pray that um, he, would, he would be given help to, to present the word of God and, and the truth of the passage to us, Father. And we ask that uh, we might be given receptive hearts and minds, Father, um, to, to feed on the word and to, to take um, what thou would have us here uh, home with us, Father. So we just commit this time uh, to thee and look for thy blessing, and we do so in the name and for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has, um, who has died for us, Father, who has, who has bought us by his precious blood, and to whom we owe so much. Amen. Now, uh, just in terms of announcements, 
Um, just the usual announcements for the Lord's Day with some tweaks. Um, obviously there's a breaking of bread meeting at 11.30 out at Bally Breaks and then we have the Bible class which has a new time of 3pm um, also out at Bally Breaks and then there is the Sunday school here um, at I believe 3 o'clock as well in the hall um, and then from 4 o'clock to 4.20 uh, there's a gospel meeting or a, a prayer meeting for the gospel meeting uh, which commences at 4.30pm um, just to say that if you are coming to the gospel meeting, please, um, as was mentioned on Sunday, please don't come any earlier than 4.20. Obviously, if you're coming to the prayer meeting, um, that's in the room upstairs. There are a number of restrictions imposed there. Um, so if, if there's too many up the stairs, I believe the kitchen is being used as sort of a, a waiting area um, just until a slot becomes available. But the gospel meeting is at 4.30 and our brother Robert Thompson is speaking there. And as I said, if you could just um, bear in mind that the hall will need to be cleaned down and, and, and made ready after the Sunday school. Um, so don't come too early. There are also uh, these little leaflets out in the foyer. Um, they've been provided for distribution. They are for the drive-in meetings at Moss Side um, in John Adams Yard. So if you know anyone who'd be interested in going to those or you feel that those would be a benefit, um, please take some and, and distribute them so that they get a good turnout there and that souls might hear the gospel. Now, just leave the rest of the time to our brother David and look to the Lord's help. Thank you, Jack. Good to see everyone that has come again this evening to share with us in the presentation of the Word of God and in looking again at these difficult not easy in the slightest. I think we have recognised that. Difficult chapters, difficult passages. I had a brother who was in communication with me this week from far away. And he said, uh, why did you pick those chapters? I said, well, I didn't pick them. Uh, the assembly picked them. They asked me to do them. He said, well, brother, that's not easy. I said, well, you just pray for it. So the Lord has given help so far. And we trust that the Lord gives help again tonight and in the week that is to follow as well in the Lord's will. We're in chapter 10 tonight. We have concluded chapter 9. And at this point in time, without any further comment, we'll read chapter 10, and then we'll make one or two link comments, joining it back to chapter 9, and then we'll break the chapter down, and we'll go forward from there. So Romans chapter 10, and verse number 1. Brethren, my heart's desire... And prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live in them, rather than by them as the King James has. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this way, Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ again from the dead. What saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, or shall not be brought to shame. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? 
And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and said, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he said, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and again saying people. We know that God does bless every public reading of his word. Last week we concluded chapter number 9 on a very, very positive note because we concluded it on a note of faith. That was good. Because there are those, when they come to these chapters in Romans, they see the sovereignty of God as being such a thing in, out of balance. And the purposes of God and the choosing of God, that it leaves no space whatsoever for any kind of response on the part of humanity. And so we saw at the conclusion of chapter number 9 last week that that cannot be true because we saw that salvation is founded upon the person who is the stone. But salvation is by belief in that person and in what he has done and in what God had determined in his sovereignty in relation to the work of that person in Jerusalem. Behold, I have laid in Zion, Isaiah said, speaking with the mouth of Jehovah, in advance I have laid a stone, a foundation stone, and yet there will be those that will stumble over that stone. Many have, many are, and the nation of Israel, in a corporate sense, represented by their leaders and by the Sanhedrin in particular, those who made a council decision to put Jesus of Nazareth on the cross, they stumbled over the stone, and so the nation was rejected. I painted on a previous evening for you and one or two did say that they enjoyed that because maybe they hadn't thought of it before. I painted a picture for you that Paul is not just writing. I'd been meditating even more on that and, and getting the picture even clearer in my mind. In fact, it's possible that he did not even write at all. I think some of his other epistles makes that clear. In fact, it's possible that one of the reasons that Luke left his official employment and traveled to minister to the needs of Paul was that Paul had an increasing ophthalmic difficulty. He had an eye problem. And it was possible even in his later letters that it was hardly even possible for him to sign his name. Never mind write the letter. And it's possible, without digressing too far, that that might even have been the thorn in the flesh that the Lord did not take away. Mind you, that's solemn, isn't it? A man that wrote the biggest single percentage of the epistolary part of the New Testament, yet increasingly unable to read even his own text. And I can just imagine in a little room somewhere in someone's house, the apostle sitting in a chair. No, I don't think so. Because you see, in his mind, he's transported back to Jerusalem. I've said that already. He's standing in the hall of hewn and stone in the southeast corner of the temple courtyard. In front of him are arraigned 70 members of the Sanhedrin and the high priest, the 71st member in the highest seat. And he is declaiming to them the defense of the gospel and the defense of the sovereignty of God and the defense of the deity of Christ. And the defense of the justice of Jehovah setting aside the nation. And the defense of Jehovah in his sovereignty restoring the nation and bringing it back again in a day to come. 
He's allowing for the minds and the voices of all those men in that audience to send down all those different opposing arguments. Seventy of them arrayed against him. And Paul is a singular barrister for the defense speaking on behalf of the Trinity. What an amazing concept. The little room that he would have been in, whatever house he was writing, and tell you this, it wasn't big enough. I can see him pacing up and down. I can see him saying it out loud, write this. And then, without hesitation, without repetition, without changing a word, for it's by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he would have declaimed a whole paragraph. And then he would have left as a manuensis to catch up and write it down. He'd say, that's that, and now move on. And we have it here in front of us, the book of Romans that the Spirit of God has prepared and preferred intact and errant for us to listen to today. I was thinking about linking these things together in my own mind, chapter 9 into chapter 10. You remember I said on a previous evening that coming from that scenario, that tableau of Paul preaching the whole of the truth of Romans in the hall of hewn stone to the Sanhedrin, that we could then go very, very easily in our minds to a previous person whose name was Stephen, who was stopped from preaching his sermon in Acts chapter 7 in the hall of hewn stone to the same audience. And then I mentioned Peter who preached that amazing sermon in the open air at Pentecost, who preached on the street in Acts chapter 3, outside the gate where the lame man was saved, who preached that tiny little vignette of a sermon in chapter number 4. I was looking at it this afternoon, and you know the conclusion I came to, it just slots in here between these two chapters. You go back and read that tiny little three-verse sermon. I'll tell you this, short sermons are usually good, aren't they? A little three-verse sermon that Peter preached in Acts chapter number four. This is the stone. Quoting from the Psalms, not from Isaiah, but the very same subject. This is the stone that was set off nothing by you, the builders, which has been made the capstone of the corner. That's just a summary of the end of Romans chapter 9. Neither. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among mankind whereby we must be saved. And if you ask me for a verse that Paul didn't write, to put across the writings of Paul... As a summary for Romans chapter 10, that verse is it. Acts chapter 4 and verse 11 summarizes Romans 9. And Acts chapter 4 and 12 summarizes Romans 10. Isn't that lovely? Just go home and read it for yourselves. Read down to the end of Romans chapter 9. And then jump back and put in Acts chapter 4, 11 and 12. And then come straight back to chapter 10. And it fits. And so... Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus, let us come to Romans chapter number 10. Let's divide the chapter down just in this manner. I I like a division. It it helps me. Uh, Some of the alliteration, it's not essential. Maybe some of the words you borrow from other places and then you modify it and add to it until you're to a degree satisfied. It, It doesn't last forever. The next time you come back to a chapter, you might have different headings. I broke it down in this manner. Verse number one, the prayer of the apostle. We've seen already that links back to verses number one to three in the previous chapter. Chapter nine, it is a kind of prayer that opens it. He had been wishing that it might be possible that he could be anathema unto Christ on behalf of his brethren, the Jews. You see, is that the same brethren here? Well, Just hold that question for a second. We'll come back to it. And so chapter 10 opens with another prayer. It actually isn't the ordinary prayer word, though it is in our King James English. It's the supplication word. He's supplicating on behalf of the nation of Israel. Verse 1, the prayer of the apostle. 
verses 2 to 4, we have the pride of the nation. Verses 5 down to 13, we have the principles of salvation. Verses 14 to 17, and you say that's the easy section. Well, we, we look at it in a little bit of detail. We'll see what's in there. Verses 14 to 17, the preaching of the gospel. And then verses 18 to 21, the provocation. That word is in there. The provocation is done by Jehovah. It's judicial, divine, sovereign provocation. The provocation of the nation. The chapter may be summarized in a sentence could be put like this. I know I've given you Peter's verse, Acts 4 and 12, that summarizes the chapter. But, but here's a human summary. God rejected Israel, not because he set aside his purposes or his promises, but because of their unwillingness to accept by faith God's righteousness in Christ. That's quote. I have to attribute that properly in public because it's not mine. I enjoyed it. And it came from our late brother James B. Curry of Japan. The passage as I saw it in my meditation, it breaks down this way. We use the different kind of structure and form in chapter number 9. I'm going to break chapter 10 down this way just to make it simple and to make it easy, I trust. First of all, Paul is asking a number of key questions. He's changing, not tactic a little bit here, but he's changing pace. Keep in mind that you can pretend and I can pretend that we are the Sanhedrin. I don't know whether we think we look like Pharisees or not, but we can pretend to be the Sanhedrin. We're listening to Paul with critical minds and we're listening to his argument. And sometimes we're drifting off and thinking other things. And sometimes something that he said occupies our mind and you stay focused on that and then you miss the next paragraph. That's very natural. And so Paul... As a man who is an excellent orator as well as a tremendous intellect, he, he changes pace. He, he picks up speed. He finds another gear. The questions become, dare I say it, maybe a little bit simpler. But the rapidity of the questions come faster. And the quotations of the Old Testament shorten down a little, but they're linked very, very closely with the questions. And so we'll see when we come into chapter number 10 that Paul is asking a, a tremendous number of rapid-fire questions. N not these 14 key legal questions that we looked back away two or three weeks ago that are spread through his writings that cannot be argued with because the answer to every one of them is an emphatic divine God forbid that cannot be so no. These are different questions. So we're going to see that Paul is asking key questions that are supplied with key answers in the passage. And as you travel down through the passage and mark them out for yourself, you'll find there's ten of them. He's going to use to support the answers to his question, he's going to use quotations from the Old Testament. He's going to use twelve of them. Maybe not 12 different books and 12 different passages, but if you read carefully, you'll find that sometimes he uses a longer quotation, but he breaks it in two or three. He puts little comments of his own in. He sandwiches them with other comments. So what we find, like in Deuteronomy, where he has a long quote, you find it's broken into three. And I'm counting them as individual pieces, and so that gives us 12 separate quotations from the Old Testament. And you say, with the Sanhedrin men, well, yes, of course they would have known. They wouldn't have had to send a secretary or a scribe for a scroll and pull it out and roll around about 10 metres of it and find the place. These men were steeped in the Old Testament scriptures, but they weren't steeped in Old Testament truth. It had become legal and dry and hard. My dear brother and sister in Christ, I trust the book never becomes dry and hard to us. I'm trying with the help of the Spirit of God that has burdened me in prayer every day before I come that these so difficult chapters are made to live in our thinking. And these men would have known what Paul was saying. 
But they'd have lost the burden of it. They'd have lost the thrust of it. They'd have lost the impact of it. It would have become dry and hard and rote. And we're going to find before we finish our subject this evening, I'm going to say this very carefully. We have prided ourselves for a long time in our Sunday schools and children's meetings and our mission fields and all the rest of it. And not wrongly so, we have prided ourselves on the capacity to learn by rote. It's not an end in itself. We need to be careful that comprehension follows after. That understanding of what is being learned. Sometimes it's better to teach less and to make sure that what is taught has been comprehended, language and all, and understood by the audience, lest it's simply words. Yes, in grace it can be used by the Spirit of God, but we should make sure that comprehension and understanding follows so that what has been beheard and taken in can be believed by those that will come to that. We'll see that as we move on. So we're going to see 10 key questions. We're going to see that Paul answers them with 12 quotations, breaking them down. We're going to see when we come to a little passage, I've been flagging that up in advance, a little passage in the very middle of the chapter, we're going to see that Paul uses six key verbs, doing words. And we'll see that in there just out of interest in the middle. And then we'll have a little summary at the conclusion of eight key truths I trust that we will have learned from the passage. The questions are this. I put the questions out first so that you can look for them as we go down through the little paragraphs that I have broken down. The first question is this. Who shall ascend into heaven, Paul says, to bring Christ down? You say, that's probably the strangest question in the chapter. So it is. Who shall ascend into heaven to bring Christ down? I'm thinking about another Pharisee. And whether he was in the hall of hewing stone in Acts chapter 4 or not, we're not told. But I'm thinking of a Pharisee, you know. And he got the very same thread, didn't he? John chapter number 3, his name was Nicodemus. No man hath ascended up to heaven to bring Christ down. But he that has come down voluntarily from heaven, sitting talking to you in Jerusalem, even the Son of Man who is still present in heaven, I'll tell you that's some statement. That's the eternality and the omnipresence and the omniscient and all the other attributes of Christ in a sentence. Who shall ascend into heaven to bring Christ down? What does that mean? Who shall ascend into the abyss to bring Christ up? If the first one was hard, the second one's worse. What saith the scripture? That's a fairly straightforward question. Verse number eight. How shall they call on him on whom they have not believed? Verses 14 and 15. How shall they believe on whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher, a herald? And how shall they preach without being sent? Those following the rapid fire down through verses 14 and 15. Lord, Isaiah says, who has believed our report? That's a question and Paul works it in. Question and quote both. Verse 16. And have they not heard a report? That is Israel. Verse number 18. And did Israel not know Verse number 19. Let me just list the quotations for you because it's not so easy to see unless you have a certain kind of Bible that puts them all out there in the margin. And some Bibles very kindly even change the font and the text so that it's very, very easy to pick out the quotations from the Old Testament. If you don't have one of those Bibles, it's not easy because it's very difficult to tell, especially when the whole thing is put in King James English. Did Paul say it, or is Paul quoting from the Old Testament? And unless your Bible, and if you haven't got a Bible that makes a distinction, it's a good idea to go and find one. I'll not not flag anything up or advertise. You can ask me afterwards if you want, but it is very useful to have a Bible that distinguishes between what is inspired text in the New Testament and what is direct quotation from the Old Testament. That's how we're able to tell how much of these three chapters is saturated with quotation from the Old Testament. Listen to this. 
Leviticus chapter 18 and verse number 5 in verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 30 from verse 11 through verse 14 in verses 6, 7 and 8. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse number 16. He's quoted that already in chapter number 9. It comes back again in a slightly different context in chapter number 10 and verse 11. Joel 2 and 32. Oh, and Peter quoted that at Pentecost. There's another amazing link between those sermons. That's in verse 13. Isaiah chapter 52 and 7. That's in verse 15. Isaiah 53 and 1. We all recognize that. That's in verse 16. Psalm 19 and verse 4. We look at that. That's in verse 18. Deuteronomy 32 and 21. Back again to the conclusion of the writings of Moses. That's in verse 19. Isaiah 65 and 1. That's in verse 20. And Isaiah 65 and 2, that's in verse 21. All off the top of his head, directed by the Spirit of God. No chapters, of course, and no verses. But such a working knowledge of his Old Testament that the Spirit of God was able to give him a steer and direction and Paul was able to quote. Put it into his writing that the scribe could put it down, that it flows. You could hardly tell where his words finish and the words of the Old Testament start and then back again. My dear brother and sister in Christ, I have been burdened in recent days because of things that I have been studying and things that I have been working on. The essential nature and need for a working knowledge of the whole of the book. And we tend to focus on certain parts, you know. We find the Gospels relatively easy. And we say, well, the Acts is fairly safe and we know a lot about the Acts. We wouldn't be too disturbed if we're going to go to the Acts, the next stage of our Bible study. We could relax if we're doing the Acts. And well, you know, Galatians and Ephesians and Thessalonians and Timothy, we've been through them two or three times in a lifetime. I have a Genesis and Exodus and Isaiah and Jeremiah and the minor prophets and some places in the old. Oh, you say, brother, I don't even know if I've read them the whole way through myself once. And I tell you, when we come to study some of these hard parts of the New Testament, we couldn't begin to understand them at all unless we had reference back to and an interweaving of the text and truth of old with new. It is a good exercise. It's not just a trite thing. And there are different programs and different manners and different ways. And listen, dear young brother, make up your own if you want to. But it is a very, very useful exercise. Even if you fall short a fraction, don't worry about it. It's a very useful exercise to try and get through the whole book in a 12 month. It's not easy. It takes discipline. It'll take a minimum of three chapters a day, no matter how you cut them up. You can do it in three different ways, or two different ways. You can do it morning, lunchtime, and evening. You can do it two in the Old Testament and one in the New. But I'm trying to make this practical. And saturate our minds with this point. That our minds should be saturated with this book. And that is a good exercise. And dear older saint, if you've never done it before. It's nice to take a wee devotional. And a daily reading. And something that Spurgeon wrote 200 years ago. That the spirit of God can still make it fresh. That's lovely. And I'm not taking that away from you. But I'll tell you this. There's no substitute. From starting at Genesis chapter number 1. And just reading. And reading. And reading and reading and enjoying the truth of the word of God. The prayer of the apostle. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That's not a long prayer. You're not going to sleep when a man prays that prayer in the prayer meeting. No. You see, tell me now, brother. The brethren in here, uh, in chapter 10 and verse number 1, is that the same brother... Brethren, in chapter 9 and verse number 3. That'd be a good Bible reading question, wouldn't it? Well, the answer is no. And because the context, and context is incredibly important in the interpretation of the study of the Word of God. And the estate agent, when they come to do evaluation, will tell you the most three important things in relation to selling your house is number one location, number two location, number three location. And the three most important things in an in relation to the interpretation of the study of the word of God as context, context, and context. If you lose the context, it becomes a pretext. Nothing more and nothing less. 
And so when we come to chapter 9 and verse number 1, 2 and 3, the brethren that he's talking about there, he defines it. My kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites. He's talking about the people of Israel. And he's saying, I wish that I was a curse for Christ on their behalf. Now here in chapter number 10, the brethren he's speaking to is the Christians that he's writing to. He's saying, brethren... Even though I am the apostle with the gospel of the uncircumcision, my heart's desire and prayer to God, not for the Israelites, no, for Israel. This is national. For Israel is that they might be saved. And it's almost as if that he parks that concept there. He doesn't really develop that to the fullest extent in the rest of chapter number 10. But he's going to come back to it in chapter number 11. And he's going to show that Jehovah in his grace is in a day to come. Because God's timing is also sovereign. Dear child of God, when we pray, we might be praying in his will. But we have absolutely no knowledge whatsoever if or when we are praying in his time. That takes grace and patience. We have to wait God's timing as well as God's answer. And I think Paul has it clear in his mind that there's going to come a day. He isn't going to see it. There's going to come a day. We not see it, not from this perspective down here, but we will see it from another perspective. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. And God is going to answer the burden of Paul. And God is going to bring national salvation to Israel. And he's going to develop that next week in the will of the Lord in chapter number 11. The pride of the nation, verses 2 to 5. You know, I was thinking about this little section, ignorant of God's righteousness. Possibly ignorant because of arrogance, possibly deliberately ignorant. Seeking to establish their own righteousness, Paul says. Not submitting themselves to the righteousness of God. Remember we said away at the start that 30% of all the mentions of the word righteousness in the New Testament are contained inside the book of Romans. And here Paul is piling them on top of each other in this passage. God's righteousness. Seeking to set their own righteousness against the righteousness of God. Not submitting themselves to God's righteousness. Not understanding for a second. Thinking they can attain favor and grace with God through law keeping. Never mind that by the time you get to the end of Malachi. Their law keeping was in the context of absolute and total deliberate hypocrisy. Paul says, not even appreciating that Christ, Messiah who was to come and has come and has been rejected, is the fulfillment, is the end of the law, unto righteousness. The righteousness of the law. As we touched on in the reading, permits a man who seeks to keep the law to live in it. I think the present tense there is important. You see, the law was punitive and judgmental. If a man did not keep the law, he came under the penalties of the law. And certain penalties of the law were exceedingly punitive, including capital. So a man could be preserved from the extremes of the penalties of the law and continue to live if at least he made the right attempt to keep the law and bring the sacrifices and so on. For they were all the directions of Moses. But that's not enough because that still works and that's still under the sovereignty of the grace of God and the purposes of God. But it's all pointing forward to something else. And what he's pointing forward to has to do with the coming of the person of Christ, the one who has come to be the end of the law unto righteousness. Paul says... They have a zeal. We could look at that word for a minute. Their zeal. That's an interesting word. They are zealous. It's the same kind of word as is used back in the Gospels of some of the disciples. It's that zealot word. And it actually, it comes 
I suppose, across into English as the same word. The root of the word actually means something that's boiling up. They were zealous and yet they were ignorant. Mind you, that's not a healthy combination, sure it's not. Zeal and ignorance combined together. And these men were zealous, but they were also ignorant. We come back to that word again further down the passage because that word ignorant, if we take the Greek word and anglicize it across into English, which it has been done, is actually the word agnostic. And so we're, we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail when we get down to the middle part of the passage. What is it to be agnostic? And how does God view that? And of course we'll compare agnosticism with atheism. And maybe we'll look at that for a second or two. Chapter 10 verse 6. Turn over the page. Chapter 10 verse 6 down to 13. The next little paragraph we have to keep moving quickly. The principle of salvation, the principles of salvation, verse 6, down to verse number 13. Verse 6, the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this way, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend up into heaven, that is to bring Christ down. Who shall ascend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. The word again should definitely not be there. But what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. And then Paul says, end of quotation, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, that's the same sentence. What does he say? What's this little strange quotation from the book of Deuteronomy that he's using here, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down. Who shall ascend, in actual fact it says in Deuteronomy in the Hebrew Bible, which translates into English for us over there in Deuteronomy chapter 30, who shall go across the sea? And sometimes in the New Testament, when you look back into the Old Testament and you say, well, the quotation in the Old Testament doesn't exactly match the way that has been quoted in the New Testament, sometimes the answer to that is quite simple. It's just that Paul or Peter was speaking to Greek speakers and so he was speaking from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. That answers quite a few of the variations between Old Testament quotations that are quoted in the New but sometimes it's more than that. And we don't have time to develop a study on that this evening or any other evening. Sometimes the Spirit of God, this is inspiration, you see. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Sometimes the Spirit of God gives illumination and inspiration to the man who is quoting. That he is able to change what he quotes. That creates a fulfillment. A looking forward to by the Old Testament passage has had at some point a degree of fulfillment. So then as it's being quoted in the New Testament, it's looking back. Peter said in Acts chapter 4, let's go back again there to Acts chapter 4 and verse 11. This is the stone which was set up not by the builders. No, he didn't. That's what the psalmist said. Peter said, this is the stone which was set up nothing by you. The builders. You see, the psalmist couldn't say that. Because the psalmist, even though he's speaking prophetically of Messiah, his greater son who was to come, did not know which generation would reject Messiah. But Peter knew. And the Spirit of God confirmed it in his mind. And the Spirit of God gave the, gave the fisherman the authority. And Peter is able to look in the eyes 71 members of the Sanhedrin, the high priest. And he's able to say, this is the stone that was set at nothing by you. The generation of the builders. And you have stumbled over the stone that has been laid in. Paul's doing the same here. Who shall ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down from above? I've already referenced John chapter 3. Who shall descend into the abyss that is to bring Christ? It's unfortunate the King James put again there. Because there's no possibility of two resurrections of Christ. To bring Christ again from among the dead ones. That's tremendous. Did Moses see that? 
Did the Old Testament worthies and fathers when they read in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and chapter 31 and chapter 32, could they have seen those passages as being fulfilled in Christ? That he must, when he cried, finished, go for three days into the spirit world and his body undecomposing lie in the grave and then come together again on the Lord's day morning and appear again on the other side. Who can do it? And who could do it? None but the power of God himself. He was raised again from the dead. And Paul is referencing that here. And that's way more than was set out for us by the words of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter number 30. What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we proclaim, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse number 11, for the scripture saith, he's moving now to Isaiah chapter 28 again, he's been there, but he's back in Isaiah chapter 28 again, whosoever, that's the same chapter of the stone laid in Zion, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between Jew and Greek, the definite article's not there. It's Jew, the nation of Jews, and the rest. He's using the word Greek because he's writing to people who are Greek in their culture, even though they lived in Rome and they were also from different parts of the Roman Empire and they were bound together by the Greek language and the Roman language and the Roman culture. So he's using the word Greek here in the same sense as he uses the word Gentile. He's just saying there's the Jews and then there's everybody else. And what he's saying is there is no difference between the Jew and everybody else. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him for whosoever. Joel chapter 2 and 32, which Peter had preached at Pentecost. Whosoever shall call upon the name of Jehovah shall be saved. Amazing, isn't it? That Paul emphasizes the human side of it human responsibility and human free will. He's already been speaking about the free will of the Jews who rejected. God sent and God determined and Peter preached that at Pentecost. He was delivered by the determinate counsel of God. Ye took him and ye crucified him. And Peter balanced the thing in a sermon in Acts chapter 2. Whomsoever the Lord our God shall call, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. And those two great principles of Scripture, they stand there. And it's difficult for us to bring them together. But here, Paul is emphasizing the human side. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Because the word is neither. It is in your heart and it is in your mouth. Let's come now to this next little section, the proclamation of the gospel. I like this section, verses 14 and 15. It's just two verses, but there's a tremendous amount packed in. How shall they call? He's asking a question again. He's asking the question as if he's asking it on behalf of those who are listening. How shall they call on him? This is logical, isn't it? But be careful, because human logic does not often, never mind always, human logic does not often explain divine principles. So often it has to fall very, very, very far short. The principles of apologetics, they'll carry us so far. But divine sovereignty and divine choice and divine omniscience and divine grace and all of those things, they can't be explained, my brother and sister in Christ. Why did he love me? Why did he love Israel? He doesn't even give an explanation himself. He says, I have loved you. Why? Because I have loved you. It's just a circular argument. There is no ground and there is no basis except the divine heart of love within the sovereignty of a divine God. So we come here to... Verse number 14, you say, well, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But if you haven't heard and if you don't know, then how do you know who or what? Well, that's what's here. 
How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall he preach except he be sent? As it is written, how beautiful on the mountains. Isaiah chapter 52. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. That's interesting as well because there's another change. You see, when you go to that passage in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 52, it's how beautiful are the feet of him. But here it's how beautiful are the feet of them. You say, what's happening here? Because here Paul is changing the pronoun by the Spirit of God from his quotation in Isaiah chapter 52 that it might apply to us. We are the evangelists of the gospel of the grace of God in the day of grace. But the total and final fulfillment of the verse in Isaiah chapter 52 that says him points to Christ. He is the final evangelist with the final gospel. And he is going to come with his feet shared with the prepper, shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. When's that? It's the day of his manifestation. It's the day of his glory. He's going to come bringing judgment on all his enemies. But he's going to come bringing reconciliation and salvation for Israel. And when he comes, coming out of Bosra, Isaiah chapter 63, coming to stand on the Mount of Olivet and divide it in two, he's going to come then. It's a him, not a them. For he's going to come in a singular triumph and no one else will be with him and no one else will help him. He will do it by himself. And so here in Paul's quotation, he has them and the them is us. But the final fulfillment of Isaiah 52 is him. And that's Christ still in the future. More than a thousand years away from tonight. That's him coming at the beginning of millennial glory and at the end of tribulation. Let's look. What we have here very quickly, just in these two verses. These are six verbs that I mentioned at the beginning. Some of you, when I talk about verbs, you see, and prepositions and pronouns and stuff like that, some people, well, that puts you to sleep. Because you say, I never was very good at grammar at school, or maybe my excuse, I had a teacher at school who wasn't very good at grammar, so she didn't teach me very much. I don't know how much grammar they teach at school nowadays. I learned a little bit and some I have forgotten. I know what a pronoun is. I know what a verb is. It's easy. A verb's a doing word. And so when you get into these two verses here, you can find six key verbs. And strangely, Paul gives them in reverse order. And so when we turn them upside down, we get them in the order in which they must happen. And I have reversed them in my notes so that they make sense for us. And by the way, at the very conclusion of our little studies, if we get out on the other shore next Wednesday evening without drowning in the sea, there might be some PDF or even printed notes. Verb number six, then at the end of the little paragraph in the two verses is this. The Lord Jesus Christ must send. There's your key word. He must send out those who are evangelists Those who preach the gospel. How can they preach unless they have been sent? Sending is a doing word. And the one who commissions them to do the preaching is Christ himself. Oh, you say, brother, you're talking about missionaries being commended to the grace of God to go to Honolulu or whatever. No, I'm not. I'm talking about the other kind of commendation, not pieces of paper from the elders in the assembly in Balamoni, no. I'm talking about the Great Commission. That every single one of us has been commissioned and commended to. As soon as we're born again and have confessed Christ, he commissions us to be. That's a challenge, isn't it? Brother and sister, public and private, children and adult, work and home, on the street, And in the playground, he commissions us to be. And our testimony commensurate with it that we can be evangelists for the one who have sent us. So the Lord Jesus sends. Those who have been sent, they become 
heralds. There's two different words in here, but we're moving quickly and let's not be technical. There is the word for preach and preaching, and there is also the word for herald. The hearers and the readers would have understood that. So there's a nice little play in the word, you see, because a herald was not necessarily a man who brought good news. He brought official tidings. He brought public tidings, he brought tidings from afar, but he could have brought very bad news. He could have come into the centre of your town and got a trumpet sounded and gathered the people and said, I've come as a representative of the Roman government to the colony to tell you that your taxes next month are going to go up 35% and they're not coming down again, or maybe 50%. Or your water supply is going to be cut off. The herald could have told all kinds of things that would not have been considered good news. But in the context of this passage, we are heralds of the gospel, of the good news, of the grace of God through salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. There is no better news. And so those who are evangelists, preachers, they must herald. What's the verb? Sound out. They must sound out the message. Then this is interesting. Those who hear this message sounded out, they become the hearers. Those who are listening must hear. The responsibility moves, and this is solemn now, the responsibility moves from you to them. Once you have told them, then they become responsible. What are they responsible to do? They are responsible to believe what they have heard because it is God's truth. Who you say then once they believe they're saved? No, you're going too fast. That's not what God says and that's not what the passage says and you can't argue with the word of God. You see, I meet a great number of people on my street preaching in different parts of the world, which I love to do, and they say, well, I believe the Bible. Okay. And I believe in Jesus. Fine. And I believe he died and rose again. Good. And I believe he went back to heaven. Good. But mister, I don't think that I'm saved. Well, the truth of the matter is they're probably not. Because they believe the word that they have heard. That's not the end of the story. It's not the end of of the transition here. It's not the end of the change. It's only part way through. We're not down through all of the six verbs in the passage. Those who hear believe. And those who believe. This is heart change. This is coming from the inside out. This is believing the positive side of the message and the negative side of the message. We don't have to hammer judgment, for I'll tell you this, every single man who believes the message of the gospel knows that he deserves to go to hell. It's not a fear of hell that saves sinners. It's something of the love of Christ that touches their heart. That God loves them so much he doesn't want them to be in hell, and so he sent Christ to die for them. But you and I, we believe both sides of the message. God would be just in sending me to a place of eternal separation. But God wants us to be in heaven. And so he sent a son to the separation. You can't say temporary because we can't measure it. To the separation of the three hours of darkness at Calvary. So that you and I could never be separated from God forever. We have to hear. And then we have to believe. And then... Oh, dear child of God, we have to call. That's different, you see. That's a private thing. That's a point in time thing. You could take years to believe. You could believe lots of things. You could believe everything or half of it. But there comes a point in time through the conviction of the Spirit of God when what happens, it's here in the passage. Those who believe, they call. Not everyone who hears believes. Not everyone who believes calls. Oh, you say, brother, you're making it narrow and narrow as it goes down, I am. And are you going to tell us now that not everyone who... No. Every single one who calls will be saved. You see, God is waiting to hear. And God will save all who call upon him. Verses 10, verses 16 down to 18 of chapter number 10. A little problem then about the gospel, again in the minds of the hearers, but they have not all obeyed it. 
They have not all listened and they have not all believed. Did not Isaiah say, Lord, who has believed our report? That, that's the preacher speaking. That's you and I. They have not believed the report. No. They have not believed our report. That is, in the generation in which that is applicable, the person who's proclaiming the message is able to say, Lord, who has believed our report? Sometimes the preacher, that's what he feels like when he sits down and finishes preaching. It's not how many or how few, it's just, has anybody believed? And there's going to be preachers in a future day who God is going to preserve through tribulation, and at the end of it, they're going to say, Lord, who has believed And they're no sooner going to verbalize that in supplication and prayer like Paul. You know what? We're going to see that next week. God's going to turn around and save the whole nation. We'll see that next week. That's Isaiah 53 fulfilled in context. That's why so much of Isaiah 53 is written in the past tense. And we learned that by rote in Sunday school. And we never stopped to think half time that what we had in Isaiah 53, 700 years before Christ came, is strangely enough, it flips between the present and the past tense. That's not our subject here. Who hath believed our report? So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Verse number 18. The clock's beating us again tonight. But I say, have they not heard? So what's the argument here? What's the question in verse number 18? The problem about the gospel. Well, let me turn the question upside down, because then it becomes more modern. What about the people who have never heard the gospel? Hmm? I mean, in spite of all the evangelists and all the missionaries and all the people and all the commended workers and all the indigenous workers and all the other things and all the Christians from all the denominations that have preached all over the world, even as far as the gulags of Siberia, what about the people who have never heard? Hmm? Are they excluded from the offer of grace? Or worse still, are they excused from the condemnation of God? Careful. Because if the second one is true, then it would be better if they never heard. Because then they would be without excuse. That can't be true. You say, what's the answer? Well, Paul says, you know, I'm a good barrister. I was wanting you to ask that question in your head because I have the answer ready. Paul says... Quoting again from Psalm number 19, not my words, but the Old Testament scripture. Yes, verily, their sound went out into all the earth and their words unto the end of the inhabited world. Oh, you say, the Old Testament prophet preachers. No, absolutely not. It's Psalm 19, one of the most beautiful passages in the Old Testament. And every time you get a quotation in the New Testament, please, dear child of God, put it in context where it came from in the Old Testament. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows forth His handiwork from day unto the next. There is no speech nor language that is necessary for. That's the point. Not that there's no speech where his voice hasn't been heard. No, there is no speech nor language that is needful. Because the preaching of the universe about the eternal creatorial power of an omniscient, omnipresent God does not need words to be conveyed. That's anti-atheism. That's anti-evolution. It doesn't matter when I'm preaching on the street what my dear friend that's listening wants to call him. As long as he's willing to accept that outside the increasing disorder of this planet, there is a supreme being who keeps it all in order, or there would be no order at all. When we get to that point and agree on that, we can start to speak about the gospel of the grace of God. The heavens declare the glory. We enjoy it ourselves. And the firmament shows forth his handiwork. There is no excuse And if there's a soul that stands at the judgment seat and he says, I never saw a Bible and it never was translated by Wycliffe into one word of my language, his mouth is closed. Because my Saviour will say, if you never heard until now of the Neil Scarred Hands, the manifestation of the power of Creator was shown in the universe. And if you had sought, and if you had followed, and if you had called out, 
God would have given light and you could have been saved. But I say, did not Israel know? Oh, I'll tell you this. They should have known. But Moses said, I will provoke them to jealousy by people that are not a people and by a foolish nation. Isaiah said, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. You say, brother, who's that? That's you. And that's I. But into the fold of grace and the knowledge of the gospel, grafted in to the promises of God, even though we no claim on the covenant promises of Israel. What a great God. What great sovereignty. What great love. What a great saviour. What a great gospel. Shall we pray? Our Father, we ask a blessing upon these things that we have so hurriedly considered. The chapter tonight is maybe a little less complicated than some, and yet it can never be simple. For there are depths in it that we can never plumb. And if we could, then our God would not be infinite. And if we could, then salvation would not be limitless. But we thank thee it is without scope, either in breadth or length. We thank thee we have a God that we cannot measure from Alpha to Omega. A God that we could fathom and a God that we could measure in human reckoning would be no use to us. But a God who is without limit and a God who is without measure and a God whose love cannot be understood or fathomed. He is the God we need. A God who sent his son. A God who sent his son to be the saviour of the world. A God who sent his son to the separation of Calvary that sinners of the Gentiles might be brought into the promises of God and the Jew as well and every nation under heaven that all who hear the gospel, be it in the voiceless creation, be it in the preaching of any man in stammering tongues, be it in a snippet of a passage of a page passed between the bars of a prison, just a single verse here and there, be it in the Bible, in our own language, what a blessing. We give thanks for a great God. We give thanks for a great gospel. We give thanks in County and we have heard it in a formal way. We have heard it in our own language. We've learned it in Sunday school. We have believed it. We have received it. And in a day of grace and deep humility, we have called out and asked God for salvation and given thanks that we have received the Holy Spirit as the earnest of our inheritance that we soon will see. Bless us as we separate. Bless our homes and bless our families and take care of us until we meet again if we're spared. For we ask it in the Lord Jesus, worthy and precious name. Amen.